we'll get started. Welcome to the library. My name is Troy Swanson. I'm the library department chair. Um, this event today, this lecture, is part of um, a commemoration we're holding with the college um, related to the events of uh, September 11th, 2001. So this is the 15th anniversary. Um, that event, as we're going to learn today, um, has ripples through world history. And I think that's hard to, den to deny. It's a major event that when we look back at US history at the early part of the 21st century will be a key moment um, with, with many different kinds of outcomes and impacts on many different people um, around the globe. And we're going to start touching on that today. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Jim McIntyre, who's a, a history faculty member and has agreed to talk about um, what happened that day and the kind of things that followed and things leading up to it. So thank you, Jim, for your time. Thank you all for coming. All right. Thank you, Troy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, so basically what I'm going to do for about the next 30 minutes or so, hopefully there'll be time for questions afterwards, is something really kind of a stretch for a historian. So I'm going to talk about things that still matter. Okay? <laughs> Mostly what we talk about are things that are long past, right? But for a lot of people, for a lot of you even, um, even if you don't recall the actual events of September 11th themselves, you've probably, you have been affected by them. If you, any of you flown, taken an airplane trip anywhere, you have been affected by 9-11, okay? Because we used to, as some of, some of my colleagues here will attest, right, we used to just walk into the airport. You could meet people at the gate from the airplane. That's, that, that doesn't happen now. So um, basically what I'm gonna start off with, you know, is how do we get, here, okay, I'll get some background in, uh, but really how do we get here? So to do that, I'm going to get into some background. I'm going to get also talk about what these sort of iconic moments I'll cycle through in a second led to, okay? Um, and then kind of where we are at now and where maybe we'll be going, all right? Because again, it, it, as I often say to my history students, right, history isn't a predictor of the future. It gives us some ideas. It gives us maybe a menu of options, but we're, we're not, you know, prognosticators by any stretch. So, okay, how did we get to these moments? Um, and I'm sure, you know, for myself, um, I can still remember that morning. Um, I was big shock in a classroom, right? And someone came in and, you know, said, terrorists attack the World Trade Center and from there like all instruction stopped and like many others right I was glued to a television set the rest of the day seeing images such as this and for the following week well for a lot of people the background on 9-11 goes back to the first Persian Gulf War of 1990-91 right for some it goes even farther back to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan that went from 1980 to 1989 um, and so, and, and that really probably is a good place to pick up, okay? In January of 1980, Soviet forces intervened in Afghanistan. Um, and as many people are aware, you know, various Afghan groups and also foreign groups, including, you know, the U.S. covertly, um, it got intervened, right? This was a front in the Cold War. Uh, but one of the groups that emerged, right, in 1980, a then 23-year-old guy named Osama bin Laden shows up in Afghanistan, okay? And he's taking part in this fight that what he views as a fight to drive out, you know, these godless communists from an Arab Muslim state. Um, and, and what he ends up being really good, now bin Laden, for a little bit of biographical background, he's the seventh of 57 sons, okay? of a, an, a Saudi construction magnate um, who was enormously wealthy and so he had a substantial stake in the family fortune and he utilized this. He also used the connections that his family's significance in, in Saudi politics, Saudi culture gave him. He used these connections to be able to filter aid to get it into this fight against communism. And they called this the golden chain. Okay, it was basically you had a lot of people who objected to the Soviets in Afghanistan and wanted to support it but didn't want to go themselves. And so he was a fundraiser, okay? And why am I, you know, you might be wondering, why am I telling you all of this? Well, 
Um, the, Soviet, the Soviet war in Afghanistan, over here we kind of call it the Soviets' Vietnam because they fight for 10 years, they end up losing, and it ends up really kind of crippling their country, contributes in no small way to the end of the Cold War, okay? Uh, but throughout this period, bin Laden's involved in, in fundraising, organizing, and he and one of his top aides, Abdul al-Azam, agree that they should maintain this base, al-Qaeda, um, for future activity should the need arise. You know, like we've built this great network, this great organization, we can't let it wither and go away. We may need it someday. So that's what they do. Um, after the Soviets leave Afghanistan, and so there's bin Laden, um, you know, they, the next big thing that happens, right, is the first Persian Gulf War. And one of the things that a lot of Americans don't get, like, and again, I watched this on the news, and, and some of you probably did as well, right, um, the way we viewed it in the United States was, you know, at, at least some, um, we were going at the behest of our Saudi ally to help defend their territory, but you know, what's in Saudi Arabia? Oil, which was, enough, which was a criticism, but also what's really important to Arab Muslim culture? Yeah, Mecca and Medina, two holiest cities, right? And so you have uh, U.S. troops, okay, infidels on the sacred soil. And again, for, for a sort of radicalized fringe, and he spent years fighting um, and, and there are certainly religious overtones to the conflict in Afghanistan, at least for some, for him definitely. Okay, so this was seen as a huge, huge insult, all right? Um, and which brings us to, okay, so what's the motivation, like what's going on for, for bin Laden, okay? One idea that was out there that gained tract for a while, okay, and still holds some tract, um, you have this guy, Samuel Huntington III, okay? Um, in 1993, Huntington's reaching, he's a big writer, a big theorist on civil military relations, um, had spent most of his career at Yale, okay, had gained a huge reputation in academia as well as policy. This was someone who got invited to the Pentagon. When he talks, people listen, long and short of it. He comes out with this book just before retiring called The Class of Cultures. And really what he's trying to do, what a lot of policy people were trying to do at this time, the Cold War ends, right? So now what? Right? What's the big fight? And so for Huntington, he says, well, the big fights of the future, as you can see here, right? Um, divisions among humankind. Read culture. Okay, when he talks clash of cultures, read that as sort of Christian materialist West versus Arab Muslim Middle East, okay? Um, and that's one of the arguments he makes in his book. Now, to be fair, um, Huntington gets read by people who make decisions. By the same time, Huntington gets criticized by a lot of people in and out of academia. One of my favorites is that, and, and this is true, I think, I've read the book, Huntington treats cultures kind of like billiard balls. Like, whenever they come in contact, they must bounce off one another. There can't be any give and take. Well, hold it. Much of world history <laughs> has been about give and take between cultures, right? Um, another big motivator for al-Qaeda and, and, and bin Laden and company is this idea of the caliphate, and that's the caliphate. Okay, you hear this term a lot. That's what it looks like. Um, this is the, the furthest extent of Islamic conquest by the 8th century, okay, which is pretty significant. But the problem with it is it, it's, it, it's not real. And what I mean by that is, yes, much of this territory is under the command of various um, generals, some of whom's religious conviction, generals, warlords, political leaders, whatever you want to call them, their, the sincerity of their religion, shall we say, is easy to doubt, okay? Um, you know, claiming that they were Muslim was a great way to rally people to fight for them, so they did it. And also, there was no real unity, okay? This would, th to me, this is almost the same as saying, well, Africa, you know, anyone who knows anything about Africa are, you know, are all the cultures, languages, political groups, do they see likeness between themselves or a lot of differences? Or in medieval, you know, if you're a medievalist, talking about Christendom, right? Half the time these medieval Christians are off fighting one another. Half the time the different leaders in the caliphate were off fighting one another. So it's this kind of created idea, right? But you do have an idea, a, a, a 
propagandist involved with this, okay? Um, and, and again, the, the notion uh, that sort, sort of emerges here, whoop, it's lost itself, okay, is that, you know, we're going to work to restore this caliphate, right? And also, if you join us in this great war, and they identify their enemies very clearly, the crusaders, um, which is Christians, Zionists, okay, and apostates are the, are the three main enemies Al-Qaeda names, okay, and, and Ayman al-Zarahari, pictured here, is one of the sort of strategic thinkers. He's also one of the propaganda people. Okay, so that's sort of what, the way they view the world, okay. The clash of cultures would probably be much more comfortable, honestly, for a bin Laden. Um, so, and seeing the, casting his struggle in those terms. All right, so what are we doing during this period? We being the U.S., the West. Well, we are kind of walking around going, all right, now that the Cold War's over, what's next? Um, and we have some people coming up with ideas uh, that I, I, they're there if anyone wants to ask later. Think, and we're thinking about ideology too, okay? Um, you have also have like Francis Fukuyama, The End of History and the Last Man and so forth. Again, talking about the next great struggles, what they might or might not be. Um, but as I said a few minutes ago, the first Persian Gulf War really kind of pushes these radical elements over the edge and so something must be done. And currently, you know, at that time, um, Al Qaeda itself is still in Afghanistan. Uh, they end up leaving Afghanistan. They're given safe haven in Sudan for a while. They're eventually driven back out of um, Sudan into Afghanistan. As they're, as they're moving around, they're starting to organize, uh, build up their, their monetary reserves, and engage in some attacks. And one of the things is, you know, I, I'm a military historian by trade, and I mention that because one of the big thinkers in the 20th century is Mao Zedong in China, and this is kind of classic insurgency. You organize, you build up, and then you attack. And one of the things that the insurgent has, by virtue, they decide when and where they're going to attack. So that empowers them a great deal. Does that make sense? Um, and, and so that's kind of one of the ideas that's put out there. Right? Some of these attacks that go on, um, after the first Gulf War, right, through the 1990s, we have things going on like this. Um, this is actually in Saudi Arabia. Okay, this was the Kubar Towers. Um, a bomb was detonated there. This was a housing facility where a lot of U.S. service personnel who were still stationed in Saudi Arabia stayed. So about 515 are wounded, uh, including about 240 Americans. Um, you also have attacks on the towers in Nairobi, Kenya, and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Those happen in 1998, okay? Um, 1998, also bin Laden issues his fatwa, his, his call to arms, if you will, where he states very clearly, we believe that the worst thieves in the world today and the worst terrorists are Americans. No real mistaking that, right? Um, so then, and, and then the last of these that comes up, right, is the attack on the USS Cole. Uh, this is October 2000. Um, about 37 sailors are killed, another 55 injured. The ship is, this is the coal on its way back to Virginia for massive repairs. Um, and this is kind of key because the U.S. in 98, after the attacks on, in Tanzania and Kenya, we launched all kinds of cruise missiles both at Sudan and Afghanistan at these training camps that were being used by Al-Qaeda and affiliates. Um, after the coal, we didn't do anything, okay? And the why of that is, you know, 2000, October 2000, there's a very contentious political race going on in the United States. Some of you might remember, right, Bush v. Gore that ended in a lawsuit. And also, Bill Clinton was still president, but Bill Clinton at that time is essentially a lame duck and his political capital <laughs> isn't great. Right, um, a lot of scandal by, had passed by then. And, but, okay, how's this red on the other side? Well, it's red that, okay, the U.S. really isn't going to do anything, okay? Um, and now, because of these successful attacks I just rattled off, bin Laden appears within, you know, this sort of radical fringe as uh, a leader who can get things done. That ups his clout, that ups his money drawing cap capability, and he gives permission to this plane project, as they call it, right, which leads to September 11th. Um, 
So that's the background, right? The World Trade Center, the Twin Towers are destroyed. Estimates run around 5,000 people die. A lot of first responders and a lot of that we're recognizing here over the next few days. There are also attacks in Washington, D.C. at the Pentagon where about 200 people are killed and the plane that the passengers downed in western Pennsylvania um, where about 45 people die. Okay, so what's our response? Well, this is a speech from then President George W. Bush, September 20th, right? A war on terror. And, and I'm going to spend some time saying that I think this is, this is a, an okay policy statement. It does what a political speech does, right? It rallies people together. It's a simple message. It's easy to stay on. But um, for a lot of people I've talked to who've served since then and since, this is a real problem because what do you do with, how do you, basically as a military person would put it, how do you operationalize? How do you come up with a plan to defeat terror? Plus, and, and that's... Also, if you look around on the internet, if you look at the, on the CIA website, FBI, um, Pentagon, you'll find State Department, um, you will find five different U.S. government-approved definitions of terrorism, which doesn't make it easier, right? Um, so, what are we fighting to begin with? And there's not real agreement on it. Okay, so. Bush comes out with this speech and, and people start planning. Very, by the end of the day on September 11th, we know that the attack was instigated by Al-Qaeda, by bin Laden, it, who is then in Afghanistan, and we start plan, you know, work up a plan and very quickly uh, we organize something that is incredibly successful, which is right, this Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, and I've sometimes posed the question with this, I've already given away my answer, right? Is it a bad idea poorly executed or a great idea well executed? And I would say it's a great idea well executed because U.S. and allied soldiers don't go in, you know, one of the motivations for Al-Qaeda was the presence of non-Muslims on holy soil in Saudi Arabia. Well, there's very little of that here. Here you have people who are being supplied and supported, native Afghans who are resisting this incredibly oppressive regime. Oh, and by the way, while you're doing that, there's this guy we'd really like to get, okay? Um, most of the operations that are done here are done by uh, U.S. and allied special operations, small groups um, who really are kind of aiding the, the locals, if you will. Um, one thing that does come out of this that's also been rumored and is true, okay, um, in late November 2001 in the Tora Bora mountain range, special operations forces did get bin Laden in their sights. Um, and this is a sticky kind of thing because what do, you know, <laughs> you're a major at most, um, what do you do? And if you've, if you've experienced the military at all, at that point, if you really don't know and you've got this guy who is the boss, what do you do? You call up for guidance, right? In other words, you're not going to find someone who's going to make the decision, kill this guy, don't kill this guy, go in and say, hello, we're the U.S. Army, we're here to arrest you, you have the right to remain silent. You're going, you know, you're going to call it up for higher authority, and in that cycle, uh, bin Laden got word and managed to escape. So that's, that's what happened at Tora Bora. Um, but by the end of November 2001, right, the Taliban have fallen apart. Al-Qaeda have run out of Afghanistan um, after incurring heavy losses, okay, on bo both groups. Um, Hamid Karzai is, is in place in power, and it looks like, right, this, the Taliban, who many people around the world detested anyway, uh, who many in the Muslim world detested because they were just radical fanatics and so forth um, and, and killed a lot of other Muslims who, who you know, for their own sort of reasoning, um, are gone. This looks good, okay? This looks like a success, but the problem is, okay, we didn't get bin Laden. We, you know, we, we kind of won the war, but we didn't get our get our guy. We didn't arrest him. So what starts to happen, right, late 2002, they start looking, creating reasons to intervene in um, Iraq, okay? And again, a lot. so one case that's made and dropped very quickly is that Saddam Hussein's regime is aiding and abetting al-Qaeda. Um, 
that is quickly supplanted by the, you know, Saddam Hussein is in possessions of weapon, in possession of weapons of mass destruction. He was at one point, um, many were destroyed during the first Gulf War, many were destroyed during some strikes that were made in 98 because he was trying to rebuild, okay, but um, it subsequently happened Right, there was, basically it was revealed that the evidence was falsified to get the UN support on this and so forth, okay. Um, there were a lot of assumptions made that this would be a really tough fight. Um, it wasn't, and, and look, to the basic fact of, of um, Iraqi freedom was the Iraqi military was in many ways a shadow of its former self, okay. It had been roundly defeated in the first Gulf War. Um, and, and to, to build on that real quick, one of the reasons why the, the NATO forces that went in um, had been training for this kind of war for 50 years. They had been training to fight the Soviets. Well, the Iraqis used Soviet equipment and doctrine, okay? But the, the Soviets never gave them the really good stuff. So it was like the A team for, the, uh, for, the, for NATO fighting the B team for the Soviets kind of thing. And so after this, and after a crippling defeat and years of economic sanctions um, that had really affected the standard of life in Iraq, the, the military just wasn't up to it. Um, a, and because they assumed that this would take a long time on the ground, no one really thought about what do we do afterwards, okay? And some real blunders are made, okay? And here's the team, okay? So George W. Bush, um, Dick Cheney, Vice President, Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense, and, and Rumsfeld bears the blame to this day, and there are many um, people in the, in the U.S. military today who still really despise this guy. Um, and that's not a good sign, by the way, when the, when the serving military despised the Secretary of Defense. That's not a good sign, okay? Uh, why? Because Rumsfeld was arrogant, egotistical, unreasonable, and the list goes, stop me, <laughs> um, the list goes on, okay? <laughs> Essentially, the, the, the attack went much more smoothly than anyone ever could have expected. I throw this, these pictures in here because, you know, after what I've told you about this, the condition of the Iraqi forces, uh, materially, you know, it's just overwhelming. But, okay, and, and then there's this wonderful picture. Um, you know, this is, is uh, George W. Bush on the USS Abraham Lincoln giving his famous mission accomplished speech. Problem with this is, um, we've now invaded I Iraq and we are now occupying the country with no real clear idea of what to do. Um, the troops who, give you a quick example, the troops who went into Iraq were Marines and Army, okay? They're trained to fight battles. If you're going to do peacekeeping, rebuilding operations, you need military police because they kind of overlap between military training and law enforcement, right? Kind of protect preserving law and order and stuff like that. Well, they, they weren't even sent initially. They weren't sent until after th problems started to emerge. Another big problem, this is Paul Bremer III, okay. Um, you know, we start this reconstruction effort um, to repair the damage caused in the fighting. It's very, it's done very, very slowly. And he actually makes a decision at one point which is, called debathification. That deserves a little bit of explanation. The Ba'ath Party was basically the political party in Iraq. It's, it's a um, sort of lash up of socialism, okay? That uh, basically it was Saddam Hussein's party. They ran the show. It was a giant, basically a giant political machine for Saddam Hussein and company. Um, if you were a civil servant, if you were a po local political leader, if you were a police chief, if you were an army officer, get the picture, you are in the Ba'ath Party. That's the only way you get that authority is by being a member of the Ba'ath Party, okay? So what do we do? Well, these were the people who were supporting Saddam, so what do we do? Well, we got to get rid of them, right? Right? <laughs> so we fire them all. <laughs> Send them home. Okay, we, we basically demobilized the Iraqi army, sent them home. So they're not getting paid, but they do have their weapons. Um, 
and, and, and part of this too gets cultural, okay? So you have a lot of husbands and fathers, um, and in Arab culture, right, part of your masculinity is contingent on you being a good provider, right? It's your manhood, okay? And so now you have no way to, to be a good provider, to be a good husband, to be a good father, and so forth. This has all been taken away, and there's no provision. Like there, you know, you're basically biased against in trying to get a job in the reconstruction effort. Okay? Um, so between these two, right, you've got a lot of really angry, discontented people. And here's a shock. We get an insurgency, basically an uprising challenging the U.S. occupation. Um, this explodes in Iraq, it gains everybody's attention over here on the news media. It all, it, you know, um, every day on the news there's the, you know, bombings, so many U.S. servicemen killed, right, um, and, or service personnel, and so forth, okay. Our response, and again, this is jumping a couple of years, from, two, from late 2003 through late, like August 2005, um, Iraq steadily kind of descends, okay. Um, and where there really wasn't al-Qaeda involvement in Iraq in 2000 or 2002, by 2005 there is. You have al-Qaeda in Iraq, okay. They've established a franchise there. Um, and so, and what's happening is that the al-Qaeda in Iraq really kind of forced their way in, okay. Um, a lot of local leaders, they force their way into good standing. How is this done? Well, look, you'll either help us or there'll be a box on your front step in a couple days and it'll be the, you know, contain the head of someone close to you, okay? That's terrorism, you know. Um, and what eventually happens is that the people of Iraq, especially, and, and another thing that had gone on under the Reconstruction, um, Shia Muslim make up, Muslims make up the majority of the Iraqi population, um, but the Sunni were in charge, okay, under Saddam. We, you know, bring democracy, so majority rules, so, she, you know, Shia in, Sunni out, um, Sunni reject, resent this, so they're not really cooperative with Americans um, until they finally start getting sick of these murders, sick of this, you know, sort of terrorism from really from Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and you have what's called the Sunni awakening, okay, where a lot of these local leaders just reject, and, and it turns the tables, and it's the classic thing, you know, how do you defeat an insurgency? Well, the best way is when the people in the, in the village or the town or the city are telling the government, yeah, the people you want are over there, when the insurgent has lost all tract. Does that make sense? When they've lost popularity, when they've lost any support, and they start to. And at that time, we also appoint David Petraeus, okay, all, along with Ryan Crocker as the diplomatic side. Um, and they really pressed the government. The government of Nouri al-Maliki was not very good. It was very corrupt, actually. And they really forced him to make necessary reforms. So bit by bit, Iraq starts to turn around. But for several years, while dealing with problems in Iraq, our back is turned on Afghanistan. And the Taliban return, and al-Qaeda return. So Afghanistan fa falls apart. Um, another key element in, in sort of defeating the, the um, insurgents in Iraq was something called the surge, where basically we sent in about 50,000 additional U.S. combat troops, um, also provided million, billions of dollars, actually, in extra aid to help these reconstruction projects. It works in Iraq. We try this in Afghanistan. It doesn't work. Um, basically, why not? Um, the simple fact is, in, in Afghanistan, the sad fact is, Afghanistan has been a war zone for decades. And you've got lots of local leaders who be, have learned over time to very much look after themselves and their own people. When we showed up in, in 2001, 2002, and started working with these people, they were open to the assistance, but then they left, okay? And then the Taliban came back. And of course, you know, since these people worked with the U.S., they were enemy number one of the Taliban, and a lot of them end up dying. So those who are left are not willing to work with the Americans or, or our allies again. Does that make sense? It's, it's a self-preservation thing. You know, my dad worked with you. He's dead. 
hmm, I'm not going to do this. Um, and of course, by then, you get in 2008, right, Obama is elected, you get the regime change is actually here, by the way. <laughs> um, and so you get a new president, new party, um, very new direction, and this idea of basically pulling out of Afghanistan, okay, um, and trying to draw down troops from both areas. So, uh, which kind of brings me, and there's, there are other things that I'm more than happy, like I didn't, to kind of stick to the topic, I'll be honest, I, I did not, you know, really include ISIS, though I've looked at what they're up to and what they're about, and I'm happy to answer questions on it. It is certainly an outgrowth, but to kind of wrap this up, you know, where do we go from here? Well, you know, the, one of the big problems that, that people are grappling with um, in, the, in the government, in the military, and, and you know, due to, because of what I do, I interact with them a lot. As they like to put it, we bought the real estate. If you invade a country and you blow it up a lot, you know, we tend to have the opinion that we should stay and fix it, okay? Um, and so we're stuck there um, trying in some level to f on some level to fix it. At the same time, I mentioned ISIS um, or ISIL or DASH or whatever you want to call them. Um, there are new threats that are emerging, okay? Uh, and the other problem, too, for a lot of people in the military and the policymakers they report to is, I put it up here, when will this end? We are a war-weary people. We're sick of this stuff, right? I mean, no one wants to hear about Afghanistan anymore, right? We'd all like to kind of forget where on the globe it is. Same thing with Iraq. And I don't mean that, you know, I mean that to really just kind of exemplify the idea of war-weariness, right? It doesn't seem like there's any clear end in sight. And, and so what do we do with this? Um, and, and there, there are people who are much, much, much smarter than me, and they are nowhere near an answer, which is unfortunate. Okay? I wish I could give you a happy ending, but it's really more of a question mark to be, but, and that's just where we are. Um, so, any questions at this point? For questions, raise your hands. I have a microphone. I'll come to you so that everybody can hear. I'm trying to formulate the question, but essentially, do you think one of the biggest mistakes um, from the West was essentially going in with that Western mindset and not understanding the Eastern mindset and the structure of these countries before we invaded? And that is part of, part and parcel as to why we are where we are today? Uh, that is part of it. Um, so. If, just to make sure I'm hearing the question correctly, was one of our biggest mistakes not understanding the mindset and culture of the places we invaded? Um, I would say that is more true of Iraq than of Afghanistan. Um, Afghanistan, we actually had some people who had long experience there going back to the Soviets. Like some of these special operations people who are, you know, were coming towards the end of their careers had actually served with you know, the Mujahideen, right, the freedom fighters back in the 80s that were in like a couple Chuck Norris movies and stuff that you know, they made over here to promote it. Um, but in all seriousness, and also I would, I would say that the, one of the biggest failings on our part, um, after, you know, coming out of Vietnam, the, the U.S., well, really Casper Weinberger, who was Secretary of Defense under Reagan, came up with some of these five points called the Weinberger Doctrine, and eventually Colin Powell added in another line. And it's really a sophisticated thing. It's, we should only go to war if our, if our interests are clearly threatened or, have been, or if we've been attacked, or the same is true of our allies. You should only go to war if you have overwhelming support of the American people. You know, all these things, right? Only pick and choose your conflict. And I think that worked for Afghanistan, but they, and again, one of the big problems, um, one of the reasons why I kind of picked on Rumsfeld a little bit was he insisted throughout his tenure that we were in a totally new state of things, right? That war was, not, none of the other things that we had learned through blood, you know, through, pe through people of a lot of different countries dying, applied anymore. His ideas applied. <laughs> so, I th you know, I think it was that arrogance, too. Um, because you, you had, I mean, 
when they went into Iraq the first time, it was using this Weinberger doctrine, and it was, I mean, operationally, it was faster than anyone expected. You know? and, and in ways, you know, as a result of that spared countless lives, through, but not just Saudi, American, British, and so forth, but also Iraqi. Because if they, if they had actually dug in and fought a long fight, how many more Iraqis would have died on their way out of Kuwait? You know? So um, I think it, and again, it's also just, it's just bad common sense. If you're going to occupy a place, you need people trained at occupation. <laughs> and if you don't have those people, bad things are going to happen. Because, you know, Marines aren't trained to be peacekeepers, per se. And that's fine. You know, if you, if you use your Marines to do what Marines do really well, if you use your peacekeepers to do what they really do really well, then it works. But you've got, you can't just say, okay, look, now your designation is this. It's kind of like if you came up to me and said, Jim, now your designation is nuclear engineer. <laughs> Move into a lead house, right? <laughs> because I'm not going to do well. So anyhow, um, any other questions? Oh. Yeah. Mark, huh? Uh, do you believe that if we'd invested more into rebuilding and creating jobs for the soldiers who were then out of work, we would have faced a significantly reduced kind of insurgency in Iraq? In a word, yes. Um, but that wasn't going to happen. One of the, uh, and look, people at the time, and, and this might be a surprise to some, actually a lot of the serving military officers in Iraq at that time wanted that to happen. The problem was the people who signed the checks were the policy people who stayed in the green zone in Baghdad, which some of you might remember the green zone. The green zone was the very heavily fortified, incredibly heavily defended former palace of Saddam Hussein. This is where a lot of neocon appointees who were sent over to run the rebuilding efforts were stationed. Um, they never left the green zone. So the, and so the military who are out in the fields, out in the villages, saying, look, you know, people will be more content if they have running water, this is obvious, um, are being told, well, we're, we can't go out there to assess the pipelines to fix the running water until you can make it safe. But, and so it's kind of like this war of words that will go around forever, right? You know, you want to make it safe? Give people clean drinking water. Well, we can't give people drinking water until you make it safe. Well, okay. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, we can argue that in perpetuity. Um, but yes, I do think that had they actually just gone out and, and made some basic improvements, done some basic rebuilding, that it would have undercut. And also, if they had just, you know, given jobs, you, you know, given jobs universally, you can work on this project. Work on this project. Not what's your political affiliation. So, yes, Ron. Like wait, 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 <laughs> wait. Freeze. We can't hear you. Uh -oh. I, thought I, I thought the, like I say, <laughs> maybe it's a little too, too loud. Anyway, <laughs> I'm saying that the, there's more killings in Chicago than there is the war in Iraq because of the Chirac. I mean, well, you know, there's that being, like I say, the, the whole thing, we, we need the jobs in Chicago and all that good stuff. And, that. and um, also the NSA has done a very good job. There hasn't been a 9-11 since 9-11, and that, not anything big other than lone wolf attacks. Well, um... Okay, so that's a two-part question. The first part I'll try and not answer um, <laughs> as best I can. Uh, because, I, I, well, yes, I mean, if you, if, if you give people jobs, they will be more content and they will probably be less likely to resort to crime, right? If you, if you, have, if you have a better legal way to make a living, you'll probably go for that, right? Um, less risk, more reward all, all down the line. Um, as far as, you know, yes, there hasn't been, but... The other thing is it's always interactive. I mean, the, the thing that people are really worried about now, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the strategy that's come out of ISIS has been a sort of three-stage thing, really to sort of focus on, you know, like you see ISIS, you know, trying to create this Islamic state. Um, so a focus in the Middle East on that. Um, and at the same time, really cultivating what we've seen an upsurge in in recent years, which are these lone wolf attacks, which are almost impossible to stop. Because 
it just is, you know, the radicalization of a few people, um, and especially, you know, truth be told, the, the ease with which you can procure firearms in the United States just facilitates. You know, if you, if you want to go do something that's going to require a gun, it's not real hard to get one. So, and, and that's, and, and again, you know, a, a, a cunning opponent will take advantage of what they perceive as an opening, and that's certainly an opening. Right? So, um, it, the, the, the whole sort of, I don't think we'll see, I could be wrong on this, I could very easily be wrong on this, but I think, um, you know, the way this interaction has been shaping up for the past couple of years, you're more likely to see m more of these sorts of lone wolf or small group type attacks like San Bernardino, for Fort Hood, Chattanooga, and so forth. Because, again, they, they, they grab the headlines, they make us uncomfortable, right? We feel less safe in the United States. Um, they are incredibly low risk for the people behind them. You know, it, you get on the internet, you, you watch some propaganda, um, and do your thing, and who can tell, really? Um, so, yes? Hi, thank you. Um, I was trying to write down my question so I don't okay. lose my thoughts. But um, essentially, my question is, what are your thoughts on um, the rise of Usama and um, Al-Qaeda based on the U.S.'s support funding Osama bin Laden and the CIA training Osama bin Laden to help fight the Soviets um, in Afghanistan and how that has contributed to um, the rise of Al-Qaeda, which is now maybe morphed into ISIS. Okay. Um, well, ever like... Yes, it's there. Like, did, basically, did we create our pr own problem? To some extent, but again, it's, it's the sort of cha the, the change that happens in geopolitics, you know. Uh, while there was a Soviet Union, the, the, this was an opportunity, this was yet again another in a series of proxy wars that we fought against the Soviets, going back to Korea. Um, so, yes, they were provided with weapons. But actually, um, the, the extent to which Al-Qaeda itself actually received CIA aid, um, that's really questionable. What, not, well, okay, but let's not be monolithic about this because when you're talking Mujahideen, you're talking many different disparate groups who have one thing in common. We don't like the Soviets. We also don't like each other a lot. <laughs> you know, but one thing we can agree upon is, you know, for right now, we'll put our personal differences, and this has been a sort of, this is a recurring problem throughout world history, right? For right now, I mean, globally, you see it during the Second World War, right? We, we ally with the Soviet Union that we have so much in common with, right? No, just Hitler. Um, but once that's gone, we fight amongst ourselves. The same thing on a sort of more micro scale um, in Afghanistan, where you have a lot of these different tribal leaders, and then the externals, because again, Bin Laden is, is, you know, he's coming in from the outside. And he attracts a certain type of person who is kind of interested in adventure, interested in a cause, looking for some direction in life, okay? Um, how aid was parsed out, and again, some of that is still classified, okay? Yes, we did aid Mujahideen, some groups, okay? Which exactly, I, I don't know if anyone actually has that definitively right now. I'm sure it exists somewhere, but whether that is public domain yet, <laughs> whether it will be public domain in our lifetimes is a whole nother question. Um, and, and again, he was, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the fundraising that Bin Laden we know did, um, and, and I'll, the reason I, well, we, the reason we know, I'll get to in a minute, a lot of the reason he, fundraising he did through the golden chain was within the Arab world. You know, this, this is a way that, you are, that Arabs can help other Arabs. The same kind of thing. Um, personal aside, I grew up in the 80s during the Troubles in Ireland. One of my older brothers played in a traditional Irish band, so sometimes we would go out to pubs to see him play, and guys would work the crowd going around saying, collecting for the cause. 
Okay. The cause is the Irish Republican Army. They are collecting for terrorists. Okay. So it's the same kind of thing. Funneling money from, you know, expats who are supportive of the cause to people on the, in the, on the ground in the trenches. Okay. And a lot of the stuff that, you know, a lot of the idea that, that we created bin Laden is just kind of hyperbole. Um, you know, it, it, you cannot, it cannot be proved yet. It, it may never be able to be proved. Okay. Um, was there, yes? So I want to ask, we're running out of time, but I want to ask a really unfair question of a military historian with almost no time left. Cool. Your talk, um, which is awesome and great, and hit the uh, external military side, but I feel like we'd be leaving something on the table talking about the impact of 9-11 without at least nodding toward the domestic side, right? Like. Yeah, identity no. politics, trust in government. There's a lot of ripples through yeah. um, our own politics um, that I wanted to give you a chance to touch on. No, and that's a great question, and I actually have an answer. So, haha. Um, but like, I think probably for me the most poignant post 9/11 moment, you know, because we have seen right, and you always have this 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 tension and this fight back and forth between, you know, is security worth giving up personal freedom, right? Um, and, and for me, the kind of moment that I always think of with that question, I had actually given a presentation in New York, and I was at LaGuardia Airport flying back. And no lie, I'm standing behind an elderly couple getting, you know, trying, going through the searches to get on the airport. Um, and, and the TSA, were, there was an older, like I said, um, the gentleman was, was not really happy about having to take off his clothes and his watch and his belt and all this. And the, and the TSA agent was being less than understanding. Um, and, and for me, the moment that got me was when he looked the TSA agent in the eye and he said, this is what I went to Normandy for. They won. And it was just like, wow. <laughs> you know, um, you, you, know that just, you could have knocked me over with a feather. Like, yeah, he nailed it. Like, you know, if, are we going to go too far in this direction of a police state at some point? Um, you know. And, and again, um, there have been all sorts of, of things that you if, if you, if you grew up before 9-11, you noticed, that, and, and unfortunately, and again, now that it's become multi-generational, will many of you be aware, you know, you used to be able to go up to Canada, no problem, driver's license, that's it, now you need a passport, you know, it, it, we were actually proud that this was the longest standing unguarded border in our history, you know, um, but not so anymore, is it worth that, you know? Um, and, and a lot of the rhetoric that continues today, uh, a lot, you know, the, of course, the USA Patriot Act, which has g garnered so much fandom among librarians, um, you know, that, that you, in theory, you know, what we read could be tracked and all those, and, and some of which is more maybe realistic, maybe a concern than others, but just the mere idea that we have these discussions means there's been a complete shift, or a real radical shift in the way we view the world as a result of the 9-11 attacks. Um, and, and yeah, I think one of the reasons for doing this talk is to make people aware that yes, we live in a very, very different world and, and it's going to be a choice of do we want to keep it or do we want to go and look for something better. I don't think we'll be able to go back, but maybe moving forward there are better things that we can do. So, maybe there's the happy ending. So. Any other Anyone questions? Else? I'll ask one more and I see if I can put this in the right way. And I know some people are running to classes, that's okay. Um, right after 9 11, we saw. Um, some ugly acts, and we're going to talk about some yeah. of that on our own citizens, people born here, um, aimed at uh, Muslims, aimed at Arabs, aimed at people who, who were neither, but thought some folks thought they were. Um, and I think that that identity politics and the discussion of what it means to be part of our country and religious freedom has also been part of this post 9-11 conversation. And I don't know if you had any thoughts you wanted to share. Related to that, just to keep putting you on the spot, military historian. Well, and we also have a, another question up here. Um, so, well, just wait a second so he gets, and I'll, I'll try and answer that in the, in the intervening time. Um, I mean, it definitely is, you know, factious, right? It, it, 
And, and I think it's really convenient because it allows for people, it, it allows for people who want to, to, to tap into that vein in our political discourse and, and just get people riled up so that they're, they're acting on emotion rather than reason. And, you know, is this a good idea? Well, and, and that whole sort of idea of like, well, then you're, you know, I honestly, looking back, one of the things that, that annoyed me the most during, through much of this period was the idea of, well, if you don't stand with the president, you're not a good American. And I'm thinking, Abe Lincoln got blamed for everything that went wrong <laughs> in the Civil War. FDR got blamed for everything that went wrong in World War II. Truman got blamed for, well, everything. But, you know, there's been a long history of sort of holding the commander-in-chief accountable, and this was sort of like, oh, well, you can't do that anymore. What, are we going to hurt his feelings? Then he shouldn't have taken the job, you know? Um, and, and that idea that, like, you know, so if you cannot second guess, that is a democracy. That is a representative republic. The idea that we second guess, and every so often, if we say, you know what, we don't like you, we don't like your ideas anymore. See ya, you know. And 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 I think that that is one of the really big threats to the whole system. Is this I, you know, this sort of mindless lockstep, you know, and and reactivity, and and yeah, I mean, a lot of it has been has been religion is also one of those topics where people stop thinking. You know, it, it's purely emotive, purely on the passions. Um, not is this a good idea? Not is this, you know, really everybody? I mean, the people I'm talking about here, and it, as is so often the case in history, Al Qaeda, Bin Laden are a tiny minority within a minority of Islam, but they've grabbed headlines all over the world because they've done these egregious acts, and that's what you see. I mean, think of Gavrilo Princeps and the, and the Black Hand Society. There's like five guys, you know, um, and they started a global conflict, but. Um, yeah, if you if you want to still ask your question, is your okay? All right. Well. Okay. All right. Other questions? How about a round of applause for Jim? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. For thank those you. few. Those very. Yes, thank few. you all for coming. Thank Monday you. we have a commemoration that starts at 8:45 a.m. Uh, it's actually on the 12th because we're not here on the 11th. So. Um, followed by Monday afternoon at 1 p.m., a panel discussion where individuals will share how 9-11 impacted their lives. So we hope you can come. Thanks.